Arteta! What a strike! Come for the detailed analysis of the Huddersfield match. Stay for the opportunity to win a chance to start for Arsenal in defense this weekend. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, and you can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. That's right. We are giving away a center-back starting position for the game at Southampton. There will be no Mustafi. There will be no Holding. There will be no Socrates. Uh, So... Yeah, it may be you, and uh, we'll tell you how you can enter that competition coming up. We're also going to uh, discuss the Huddersfield match. I have thoughts. You may be surprised to know I have thoughts. I'm not sure if the panel has thoughts, but we will find out because we'll certainly ask them the questions. Um, Tim is here. You can find him on Twitter at Stilberto. Hello, Tim. Hello there. Hello, indeed. And Clive's on Twitter at Clive P-A-F-C. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, indeed. Okay, look, before we get to the match, um, it is the sad reality of the world we are living in right now that the headlines have been taken by racism. And uh, it is just one of those things that I think when you are on social media and Twitter in particular, these kinds of issues can be amplified. And sometimes you just need a break. It's like too much internet for the day because there are so many toxic, terrible, uh, hateful people on the internet. But then you look at scenes around the stadium and you see bananas being thrown at Obamiang and you see the racist abuse directed at Raheem Sterling and you realize that it is... Uh, extending beyond the digital world, and it is very much a part of the real world. Now, maybe it's naive to think that that had been going away, but certainly, you know, it, it may have felt like we were making progress, and that progress feels like maybe it's receding now. So I think we should touch on it a little bit, and certainly there's culpability, uh, not just from individuals, but from the tabloids and the way they cover these situations. I mean, Raheem Sterling has had to come out and make a statement himself, not getting protection from the Players Association until he came out and did it himself, which I think is very telling as well. So, Clive, I'll start with you. I mean, obviously it is sickening to see this sort of thing happen happening, but what is your take on uh, Sterling's treatment and his response? Yeah, I suppose most of the people that listen to his podcast and and your good selves are intelligent people, right? And we see the number of these sort of race storms <laughs> come up. And... Um, and to be honest, when they tend to come up, my first reaction is is not to react because you often find Twitter becomes a a race to be outraged and we get people saying, this is outrageous, this is outrageous. But really, the understanding varies, right? And it becomes a statement and a statement of who, how you feel towards something. And, um, and we all feel this is not quite correct. So I think there's a slight different angle with this. The, the actual influence of the media has been quite specific and, and been called out. And that's a very brave thing for Sterling to do. But I almost, I, I look beyond this, right? And um, I look beyond the superstar athlete and I look at, you know, people that the superstar athletes that do suffer these things because of their, because they are high profile. Sterling is, is the highest paid British player in the Premier League. And so he has circumnavigated all of the racial prejudices against him throughout his young life right so um and yet he's still not immune to it and there are many american sports stars we've we've spoken about previously earlier that are not immune to it no matter how rich they are and how famous they are it's just a way of um keeping people in in their right place what people don't realize is is how this impacts the average guy like myself and um, the average guy out there trying to get a job, trying to hold a job, trying to get an interview, try to create opportunity. And these preconceptions actually control how people can get opportunities in life because a lot of the decision makers out there that give interviews, that give opportunities, that give chances to young people of ethnic minorities in particular or females, they look at these preconceptions and they become conditioned. And when I say that, I mean, it's a really serious topic. For someone to get a chance to get the right job at the right pay, what that does is that controls where that person lives, who they work with, what sort of environment they have, what sort of car or house they have. It really does control your life and how you turn out and your children's lives. And I think people have to really work hard to to get those opportunities. And, and this sort of rhetoric only goes to reduce those opportunities. And I think John Barnes has some great stuff today on TV today that got me thinking about this. And I've always felt this. 
I'm very fortunate myself. I, I, I earn well and I've always earned well, worked in, you know, for, for banks, etc. And so I've managed to get around it. But those people like myself still sort of have a fear around what if it ended and will I be allowed the same latitude? And John Barnes is a great example. You know, um, one job in management, no second chances. The ability to make mistakes is not the same. The standards are different. And this is a massively huge topic. And I'm not sure it's one for Arsenal Vision, but I'm glad you give the opportunity to actually speak about it. Because I think, don't dismiss this. This is how the power of messaging, this is how people are, are kept where they supposedly should be. And what we've seen today, I feel, I actually find it quite refreshing, is that people look at this far more deeply than, in my opinion, than times previous. And I think, I hope this debate goes on. And I, for one, think Sterling was incredibly brave to take on the newspapers that have been taking him on for the last four or five years and really bring it out, bring that debate to the to the front of our minds. And I think it's been well, and what I've heard and read, um, I think it's been really well articulated so far. And, um, and rather than debating the minutiae of the comments and who it affects, people are looking at it far more holistically. And I, and I think today has been, has been quite positive. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that is extremely well said. And I, I think it's an important contribution that you make. And you're absolutely right, is that, it is easy to brush aside what Raheem Sterling deals with and say he plays a kid's game for a living and he makes millions of pounds a year to do it. First of all, that doesn't excuse uh, racist treatment towards him. But that racist treatment towards him has a knock-on effect for people who are not in as fortunate and privileged a position as he is. Um, not yeah. Again, not that he deserves it or it's okay, but you're right that uh, it trickles down to people who are not in that privileged position and and has real ramifications for their everyday life. And that is a shame. And look, as an American, race in America is part of the fabric of the history of this country. And it is a, a battle that we fight every single day, trying to elevate ourselves from the really uh, insidious history that we have uh, in our past. So, you know, it is something that we, we hope that we are free of, but truly we are never free of it. And you just... You know, I, I think the one thing that for me is encouraging is the people I mostly come in contact to in my life, uh, on the internet, you know, in IRL, all that stuff, have the right attitudes, have the progressive attitudes, have the open-minded, you know, uh, uh, modern attitudes that you'd hope to experience. And I realize that just because I've come across those people doesn't mean that that's who populates the world. I have certainly been exposed to the the other side of that, but... I'd like to think that this is the death rattle of racism. N not that it's ever going to be completely gone. I understand that. I'm not trying to hand wave it. But that, you know, throughout history, where progress has been made, it's not made in a straight line, right? It's a pendulum. It swings towards progress, and then it swings a little bit back. And hopefully what we're seeing is just that slight swing back as we move in a progressive direction towards equality and, and, and towards an improvement in the overall situation. The one thing I will say is that I think what the tabloids do is despicable. And I think that they they are radicalizing people, and this is something that that I I almost have a I almost feel sorry for some of the less intelligent people, the sheep who are easily herded in this direction. Because I can tell you this much: there are people who read those tabloids, the the subtext of what they are writing sinks into those people, and it it, it helps racism take hold in people who may not otherwise have have really had those feelings, and and it does radicalize people and. You know, they, they have a huge burden uh, on their shoulders, and they, they bear a tremendous amount of responsibility for what happens uh, around the world and, and certainly in, in England right now. So I think we are in total agreement there, Tim. I don't want to shut you out of this. It is obviously very, very mm -hmm. important. So just quickly, I mean, do you feel, I mean, you know, when, when we talk about racism at football grounds, it harkens back to the 80s and, you know, sort of a, a different era of football. And there were some very, you know, there are romanticized things about what football was like back then but there were a lot of really horrible things and and certainly racial abuse and racism were a part of it do you see anything as someone who's a regular match going supporter that suggests to you that you're moving back not you personally but that football is moving mm -hmm. back in that direction or do you feel that overall you still see a movement towards progress it, it's difficult for me to say because um I, I so i don't think i've seen a rise in you know over 
um, what we've seen this weekend, for example, like outright racist abuse. But, you know, I can't speak to the way people look at you, the way people talk to you, you know. And um, when, when you know, you are black or ethnic minority or a woman or, or whatever, um, I'm, I'm not in that position. But um, so I, I can't speak to perhaps the way people speak to you. And maybe they don't even always know they're doing it. Um, but I think Clive makes, you know, good points about the standards being different. You know, I, I'm really nervous about Sol Campbell at Macclesfield because oh, I'm not sure. Too, too, me too. I'm, I'm not sure it's going to work. And he's been you know, set up be, for a fall, isn't he, mate? He's been yeah, set up. yeah. And both he probably won't get a chance again. But you know, when people are like, "Oh well, Paul Ince got a Premier League job and that didn't work," as if like Paul Ince suddenly embodies every single black football coach in the world. Um, and and those kind of standards, but one one thing I probably will add, uh, um, hopefully usefully, I, I think you're totally right about um, the way, shall we say, certain tabloids write about Sterling um, in particular and other young black players, and I think you're right, there is a radicalisation element, but I think um, and and it's it, I suppose a good thing that everyone's calling this out, although. Obviously, the ideal scenario would be there'll be nothing to call out. But I think we do also have to reflect and not lay this entirely at the door of the media. And, you know, people who I'm sure there are people who click on the Daily Mail website in their lunch break who are probably, you know, quite liberal people and they understand what type of website it is. They understand what type of newspaper the sun is. But, you know, it's like junk food for the brain. It's just a little... Um, going to read that sidebar of shame i'm going to read what you know what like kim kardashian ate for lunch and all of that and that kind of, and you know at, at the risk of sounding preachy thinking people have to stop fucking doing that because a it's no good for your brain <clears throat> yeah it's total junk food for the brain and it just legitimizes um some of this kind of really nasty febrile reporting and uh you know i th i think maybe some of us have to think about some of all of us have to think about uh, some of the guilty pleasures in our lives in our media consumption because um it, it will keep happening if they keep getting the clicks yeah you're absolutely right about that i mean it, we teach our content providers the kind of content we want by consuming it mm. um so obviously you know you need to be listening to this podcast more and contributing to this podcast patreon more and not giving the Daily Mail your clicks is the story there. But all kidding aside, I mean, it's absolutely true. The thing I would say is, look, most people are very dumb and very dumb people are easily led and the tabloids have the ability to lead dumb people in bad places and they do. Um, it's a shame, but it is what it is. I, I think given that I, I could take a wild flying guess that the majority of people listening right now are nodding in agreement, I don't think we need to gild the lily, so to speak. I don't think we need to go any further. It's not, again, to minimize the significance of this you could do hours on this and not even scratch the surface on the significance of this topic but uh certainly not why you are here right now most likely and and i think that we have some things to say on the football that may be worth your time i can't guarantee that uh clive is that that sit well with you at that point or do you want to have a sort of a final word on this no absolutely i think um well i i, I think it's really important that we we spoke about it i think it's very very topical and um I think it'd be remiss to to miss it, and uh, I'm glad we did. Yeah, and you know, the, as a last thought, the one thing that really does bother me: Raheem Sterling has basically done nothing wrong. Like, what would his treatment be like if he made a mistake? If he well, did, what would a his bad treatment be like if England had a poor World Cup? I guarantee you, there'd have been one scapegoat, and he was already <clears throat> he was already in place. And um, but England managed to do fantastically well, and he was part of that story, and he's continued his progression. So he was set up to be the fall guy, and um, and Gareth Southgate and the rest of them made sure that they did something that the country was proud of. And that's the way media works. You, we, we, we're starting to get intelligent now about how media works um, and how messaging works. It's not just the mass media, it's social media, and how that works. And um you know what? Most of the listeners on this podcast are getting intelligent to that as well. And um, and so I'm, I've been really pleased with the reactions today, generally, because I think the intelligence is increasing and um, people are having the proper debate, and I think that's wonderful. Yeah, and I, I think it's fair to say the listeners to this podcast are among the most intelligent people you could find. Absolutely. So Absolutely. it would be it would be remiss for me not to mention that. Okay, let's get on to the football. 
It was Arsenal 1, Huddersfield nil. Nothing makes me uh, laugh or smile more than a uh, team full of time-wasting Fowley cunts uh, losing late and then trying to use all the stoppage time they accrued to chase the game. Um, thankfully, they got nothing from it. 1-0 to the Arsenal. I thought it was well-deserved. I'm going to have probably a very different kind of take on this match than you would expect. I thought this was a perfectly creditable performance, both by the coach and and by the players, which I think is going to not necessarily sit well with some of the listeners, but I will explain that. And I'm sorry I'm going off-brand there. Uh, but, Tim, you know, first and foremost, Emery had to make a decision about how to line up for this one. Mm. Sort of the first, quote-unquote, easy game since we've gone to the back three, right? I mean, Bournemouth was going to be a tough game. We expected them to be difficult. And then it was Spurs, and then it was United. And this was the first, quote-unquote, easy game. I think everybody was curious to see, would he go back to the back four? Would it be attack, attack, attack against Huddersfield at home? He's stuck with the back three. Interestingly, more of the 3-5-2, not the 3-4-2-1. Mm-hmm. Starts Lacazette and Aubameyang up front. Were you surprised, but more importantly, were you disappointed that he didn't go to a back four against a weaker team at home? <laughs> the the weird thing is, like all of Emery's lineups surprised prize i think most of us to a degree just because um he keeps doing something slightly different and he's difficult to read at the moment but he also manages to surprise you in a different way every time so not not only was i i was expecting a return to the back four um just as much um when it comes to uh the the amount of options available quite frankly i I didn't see you know licksteiner coming in at center half um but also, yeah, the three-five-two surprised me. Uh, I, I said in the match preview that you know talked about kind of splitting out Lacazette and Aubameyang's game time and always leaving one of them in reserve for when we needed them. Um, and this is kind of it was weird because this is a formation I've kind of vouched for a little bit um, that I think suits the personnel we have. But I don't think it suits the personnel we have when there's no Özil or Ramsey. Yep. Um, in there, I, th- I think it needs like. It actually needs a number 10. Like the one time that Emery lines up in a formation that actually suits a number 10, both of his, you know, um, advanced midfielders aren't available, which so, so it did surprise me. Yes. Um, you know, I was willing to, to see to see what it looked like. What was really interesting as well was that Huddersfield seemed to seem to like second guess it because they went man for man on our three man midfield and we don't usually play a three man midfield so um i wonder if that was just complete luck or whether wagner had some amazing insight no that's, um, that's luck in, in, <laughs> no <into> way <laughs> this. but but they did it like from the if you go back and watch the first 20 seconds of that game that is exactly what they do there's no like adjustment period period it is exactly what they do from the beginning so uh, that that kind of confused me i wonder if like he had a mole in the dressing room or something um but yeah i i was quite surprised just because i i, I like this formation for arsenal i, I didn't quite think we had the players to make it work i'm slightly nervous about playing a bamiang and lacazette together at the moment just because i think we really should be leaving one of them in reserve for when they're needed because because i think we kind of saw he went for the double sub again at half time but I, 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 I think it worked a little bit but not that much and with about 20 minutes to go i was thinking like what now because this hasn't hugely changed the game and we've got nothing else now. Um, but Yeah. Um, it, it didn't help that Iwobi had a trampoline attached to his legs. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously that, that was a part of it. Although the the positions he was, he was taking up were really good and really valuable. But yeah, the ball was bouncing off him. Mkhitaryan showed some nice touches in tight areas, which we missed a bit. But n- none of it really did anything. Um to change the game and I think if you watch Adrian Clark's breakdown he had like a good stat about the number of touches in the first half for Aubameyang uh, compared to the second half he had half the amount of touches and that's when we were really turning the screw and going forward so I, th- this is one of those times where Emery's made a, a half-time change and I, I don't think it really changed anything and I don't think he really gave himself um, a lot of avenue to do anything else. Yeah, okay, so here's my only thing, right? We know that Wagner's Huddersfield press. That's kind of what they do. They're going to put you under mm. pressure. They're not going to sit in a shell. They don't sit in a deep block. They they do press. And that means that you can have a lot of broken play. And we've seen mm. recently from broken play that 
you know, if we can get the the one ball in transition right, we can create chances. And what I would argue is, okay, I, I know there are people, some people who have reached out to me on Twitter even saying, it's the wrong way to play, small team at home, maximize your number of chances. I would disagree with that. What I would say is, this team has proven in a back four, it's going to concede chances, that it is not solid defensively in a back four. And that the one thing you can't afford to do is concede first or really concede it all at home to these small teams. You make the job tougher. So you reduce variance by giving them no chances. So we we kept it tight at the back. We played to take advantage of the fact that if they pressed and if we could get by it or if we could get the ball off them, there'd be some space. And here's the proof in that pudding. We had chances. Okay, Lacazette scored a goal that should have been a good good goal. Aubameyang just misses past the far post. Lacazette slips when he should be scoring. Um, we had one offside for Aubameyang that wasn't offside. We had the the offside goal for, for Lacazette that I mentioned that wasn't offside. Aubameyang had an incredible curler shot that was well saved. Um, there were chances. We had chances. So, you know, I, I don't... I don't, um, you know, I don't disagree with your overall contention that it was fine as a performance because I, I think you're right to say, like, Huddersfield didn't create anything, nothing, really. One chance all. in the whole game from a Shaka giveaway. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. I take your, I take your point there. Then you only have to score once, which is what we did. And yes. I, 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 I don't disagree with your contention that it was fine overall, particularly when you're getting into this time of year. Yeah, I mean, look at it this way: if you concede four shots to the opposition, right, you could get stung by variance that one of those shots goes in. You know, they get lucky. It's a good, you know, deflects whatever. If you concede no shots, you concede no goals, and then you figure we've got enough talent to to find a goal somehow. So. I realize that that may not be the right way to approach it, but I thought the proof was in the pudding. They pressed, we got the ball, we created some chances, there were some bad misses and some bad calls. Clive, let's stay on this topic just really quickly. I mean, do you think it was incumbent on the the manager, the the coach, to be more progressive in his approach to this game? No, not really. I I think um, I look at this game as the the fourth game after Bournemouth, um, Spurs, um, Sorry, I've got Manchester United, and this is the fourth one, right? So, and to me, this is always going to be a bit lumpy. And we've had these games before in the past, and we'd have a draw, or because we concede one, we'd have to get a late goal. And I, I think he just decided, you know what? Let's make sure that we don't concede. Let's make sure that we're not going to be as sparkling as we normally are. We'll try to keep the emphasis high up. That if we do get chances in broken play, we've got two strikers to keep them. I, I wasn't sure about. When I first saw this team, I wasn't sure, but I just happened to be listening to the Arsenal online before the kickoff. And, and Adrian Clark, he's really good, right? He called it. He said that the midfield three versus our midfield three is going to be fire versus fire. And he called it before the game that they would press our midfield three one man for man. And so it's obviously something that Huddersfield do that I hadn't noticed beforehand. And they are very abrasive in terms of field and they make lots of fouls. And and it was an ugly game. So rather than play artisans, he said, well, we're going to fight you. We're going to fight you right in there. And by the way, when, we, when you lose it, because you're not as good as us, we're going to go straight into our two strikers and we're going to score. And everything was was set for that right we left two goals on on the pitch in the first half that could have been two nil half time hot dogs carlsberg sit down enjoy yourself right that's what it should have been but it wasn't because we didn't take our chances we were rusty up front and um we ended up in a in a massive arm wrestle so i i don't look at it with sometimes you don't look at it and say okay let's pick this player that player because we are going to play well Sometimes the coach can smell an average performance coming from his team. And the best thing to do when you're when you're like that is to make sure you can compete and you don't lose and you don't create something that you can't come back from. And I've seen that many, many, many times at Arsenal where we are not aware of the opposition. We don't adjust ourselves for them. We don't respect them enough. And we allow ourselves to be pressed out the game make a mistake, let's just let Arsenal make a mistake and then we'll take them and then we have to do something miraculous to come back from one or two goals down to 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 salvage a point. This time we, we controlled the game, didn't concede chances, it was ugly and we won. Yeah, And, and, and I think it's down to the major. And I, I, look, I totally get that some people could view this as being too conservative for the occasion, but I think under a lot of the circumstances uh, and especially given our vulnerability defensively, 
and the fact that we've conceded in first halves, we've had to fight back in second halves, I think the decision to play a team that presses, that isn't going to sit in a deep block. Look, if he had gone with this lineup against a team that just parks the bus and plays a, a, a deep block, I would have said, that's a problem. There's not enough playmaking. There's not enough um, you know, final third possession in this team. We're going to struggle to create chances. We created chances from broken play, and, and we should have been home and dry at the end of the first half. I... I think another issue here is just the refereeing. And Tim, look, I, I know you hate to talk about referees. So let's <laughs> not talk about it in the context of he had a poor game, is a terrible referee, because I know you have no time for that. But let's talk about it in the context of how it affects the game. When a team employs rotational fouling as a tactic, and they don't let you get any flow or any cohesion to the way you're progressing the ball, I think that that totally changes the way a game is being played, obviously. And I, I do think that... that they were emboldened by the fact that they weren't getting getting cards early, and it allowed them to really get away with destroying the first half as a spectacle for the most part. Yeah, yeah, I, think I realized so. there was, was no clearly... question at the end of that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it was clearly a tactic, right? So they committed, I think, twenty fouls, um, and almost all of them were in the middle third of the pitch. You want to hear a crazy uh, statistic, just real quick? They committed more fouls in the first half than any team in the Premier League this weekend uh, committed all game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can tell that that's um, that that was kind of a tactic, and uh, I don't have much of a problem with that because um, I'm sure we'll get onto this. I'd I'd like Arsenal to to employ those tactics um, C- when City necessary. Does it. City does it. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. and I think we have been, um, and I think we did a little bit. I think um, a couple of our bookings for simulation were. Um, I, maybe a little, maybe, maybe I'm just like really just trying to let the Arsenal players off, but I think there was an element of frustration to it, but you know, it slightly raised the temperature of the game. I, I, I tend to think you're right. I don't think the ref at first I thought he did deal with it. Okay. Cause he went and spoke to the Huddersfield captain quite early, which is exactly the right thing to do. Cause he spotted it was rotational fouling and he spoke to the captain and he was like, look, I know what's going on here stop it otherwise i am just going to start giving yellow cards i presume that's what he said and so you think okay okay because this is the thing this is why rotational fouling is such an effective tactic there's nothing you can do about it really as an official unless you go a little bit rogue and just say right i see what you're doing i'm going to give a yellow card for every foul that you make even if it's not strictly a yellow card offense which i'm not sure the refs are really empowered to do but yeah, I think he lost control of it a little bit at the end of the second half. And I actually think it almost that that maybe contributed to the Xhaka booking for diving. I kind of tend totally to think agree. the ref was, yep. his temperature was going up a little bit as well. And um, l- listen, this is a really underplayed part of when people talk about referees losing control. I bet they get pissed off as well because they're like, look, like for fuck's sake, you're all diving and pulling each other's shirts. And I, I bet referees, like even subconsciously, just think you are all dickheads and you're all pissing me off. So I'm just going to start getting yellow cards out in a minute, and it's cumulative. Um, but yeah, of course, as, as a ref, you should kind of spot that. But I, I, I tend to think that um, we we did fight fire with fire um, a little bit. We were. Um, it's it's annoying and it's frustrating, um, but I I felt like we dealt with it pretty well, even though now two of our centre halves are out suspended, and you know that's that's three suspensions um, we've had now for five yellow cards, and Torreira's one yellow away, and so Shaq is at, back on one already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're looking at basically our two centre halves, one of our defensive midfielders, and the other one's hanging by a thread. And by the way. Uh, Torreira didn't really play the first four games of the season. He needs to and, get a yellow against Southampton. Yeah, yeah, Big no, time. I agree. And and if Licksteiner was any sort of regular, I'm sure he'd have racked up five by now. <laughs> Ten, so, yeah. you know, I I think I think we can um, you know talk about how Huddersfield came to 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 kind of spoil us in perhaps um, a not entirely legal way. But I, I I don't think that we were angels either. And and 
and personally i am absolutely fine with that in fact i'm delighted my but my my principal frustration i think maybe with the officiating is this is the one fucking time i can remember you know where he puts up seven minutes at the end and i think do you know what that is probably about right you've probably measured every single like second of stoppage time which is fine but why is this the first time yeah, it's ever it's happened? all been added back when it was yeah when it was like one one against wolves and we got three minutes and one and a half of those minutes was taken up with an injury anyway yeah you, you and, know uh, what yeah, Tim, though, what, i i would love to see a rule come into football that if the team that contributed to the lion's share of stoppage time is trailing at 90 minutes they don't get it you know what i mean so yeah, like yeah, yeah. like let's say there's seven minutes of stoppage time but six of it is the trailing team you put up one minute because fuck them they shouldn't get it back um i just you know, and look, it is my tribalism speaking to some extent being annoyed at them for employing those tactics. But I do think that there is a fine line between stopping a counterattack with a cynical foul that draws a yellow card, but you have to do it because it's smart. And, you know, riding the luck of the referee's permissiveness to employ your tactics. If the ref is handing out a few more yellow cards a little earlier in that match, Huddersfield have to change their approach. So... You know, it is incumbent upon the referee to some extent to determine how far he's willing to let those tactics go. And to, to be fair to Huddersfield, they went as far as the referee would let them. I mean, Clive, I I really didn't have a big problem with the first half performance. A lot of people did, but we gave them absolutely nothing. And we created chances to be home and dry by halftime, which is all you can ask for. The Lacazette goal is a good goal. The Aubameyang miss is, you know, it's, it's not a terrible miss, but it's a miss. And the Lacazette miss is a miss. And right there... You got, you know, three goals, and you, sh- you expect to reasonably expect to get one of them, um, and we didn't. So, you know, I don't know. What do, what do you think about the dives by Arsenal players? I mean, I, I think some of this is down to the game we just played at Old Trafford where we get the shit kicked out of us, and then the first half in this game we get the shit kicked out of us. And it's like, if I stand in front of you and punch you in the face three times, what are you going to do when I raise my hand the fourth time? You're going to flinch. You know, and I think these players started to expect contact, and I will tell you this. If you were going to tell me that that Sun penalty is a penalty because one stud raked across his foot, then don't tell me Ganduzi's is a dive. You know, it's that's the thing that's well, frustrating think, is the lack of con, the lack of consistency between referees. I mean, do you think the dives are the kind of thing we should all get a fainting couch out for? No, nah, well, the Ganduzi was a dive, and you know what, mate, you, you dived and you, you looked embarrassed, so you got your book in and jogged back to the halfway line. I think um, Shaka was a response to what was happening around him. He was trying to say to the referee, um, look at look at what's going on, but <laughs> but he just flopped to the ground. That was a dive for me. So that was a frustration dive. But actually, I do think Mustafi got caught. I think he got volleyed in his foot. And um, it's one of those things that you, the referee could hear rather than, than see. And he just, well, I think it was just a bit cheated off of Arsenal and uh, gave it the other way. So he was a bit unfortunate. But everything that we're seeing really is a, is, is, is a byproduct of us not being so naive. We're taking these teams on. With, when they're fouling us, we're letting people know. When they're fouling our, our teammates, we're gathering around the referee. We're not letting people take liberties with us. We're, um, we've had 11 bookings in the last week, would you believe it, under three games. And that's a lot, right? So, um, and, and I, 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 for one, I quite like it. I quite, you know, I read something today that we've made the most tackles this season out of the big six, right? So we are the number one team. It's not just about pressing. It's about tackling. We are tackling people. We are taking the ball from them. We're robbing them. And just think back to some of the goals we scored recently. We have won the ball and then transitioned. Right, so and so people are watching this. Now looking at our midfield, I mean we we spent a couple of years on this podcast talking about a lack of a midfield. Now people are lining up to stop our midfield. That tells you something is right. You know, we've got the three players we had the weekend in the last week or couple of weeks or so, they've all had stellar performances. Right? I think Shaka's had a bit of a dip recently, but post Liverpool, but the other two have had stellar performances or stellar moments and people are noticing them. So they're now lining up against them and they're taking them on. I mean, Torreira is one of the most foul players in the league and he is going to be marked every week because people don't know about him. So they're going to stand on his toes because they recognize his influence is growing and he is influencing our team. If anything, you know, you might people will say that as always our most talented, best player, maybe in the club, our most influential player. Could, could be that little Torreira. He's influencing both ends of the pitch and in the middle, right? So there is no more that he can do, and so teams are going to watch that and they're going to they're going to 
start going for him. And uh, we need to, you know, I, I said before the game we should arrest him on Saturday. It's not because, you know, I was worried about post-holding, he might get an injury. But if you look at what's happening, he's getting smashed every week and, he's, and he spends little time getting up. And every time he does that, I have a deep intake of breath, right? Because for me, our season is very much dependent on, on his health and fitness throughout the rest of the year to get where we need to get to. And so, you know, that's one angle. The next angle, Elliot, you may come to a little bit later. I think we're starting to see the same the same ones and twos he players have good performances. And I think there's a few out there, May, I'm sure you're going to touch them, so I won't take it all now, that need to step up. And we do need them to start showing a bit more than what they're showing. We're, we're cheerleading, watching a certain couple of players do really, really well. There's a few others that really need to show, and I'm sure you'll come on to them a bit later. Yeah, yeah. Let, well, let's get into individual performances. Let's do this. Let's put on our best thong, throw on a nice chemise, settle in and learn about lingerie. When we come back, we'll talk about the performances to savor, maybe the ones that weren't so great, and what we think we're going to do with the central defense, and who is going to win the right to start in central defense for Arsenal uh, against Southampton on the weekend. All that and more coming up in a moment. Stay with us. Guys, this holiday season, how about giving your wife or girlfriend something totally different? Something romantic that celebrates the unique connection between you and her. I'm talking about a luxury gift service called Enclosed that delivers designer lingerie to your lady month after month. Enclosed is like a flower of the month or beer of the month, but instead of flowers, she gets surprised with ultra high-end lingerie. And this is seriously high-end stuff, the kind of quality that will really impress your lady. Enclosed was designed specifically to help guys find gifts for their wives. Enclosed is all about helping you make her happy. This fosters intimacy and closeness, and as someone who is married with a toddler, I can tell you this kind of thing is so important as a relationship grows over time. And Enclosed is effortless for you. Every month, Enclosed sends your wife or girlfriend a custom curated lingerie gift selected just for your lady, and they back the gift up with a 100% size guarantee so you never have to worry about fit. This is as easy and as satisfying as it gets. You can join more than 30,000 couples that love Enclosed. And I'll give you a little gift. Right now, you can get $35 off your Enclosed gift. Just go to EnclosedLingerie.com. That's EnclosedLingerie.com. Enter the code ARSENAL. Can't forget that one. Enter the code ARSENAL at checkout and get $35 off any Enclosed gift. Why not give your wife or girlfriend something that really reflects and deepens the connection between the two of you? Something that you would never give your mother. That's enclosedlingerie.com with the code ARSENAL for $35 off the best gift ever. Do it now. Okay, we're back. Uh, Now that we are all set for the holidays with the finest lingerie money can buy, we can talk about the finest players money can buy. Many of them reside at Arsenal. Tim, one of them is Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. I, uh, you know, I am a huge fan. You may not know that. He he's playing another ninety. It looks like for right now, Emery has moved back uh, squarely into the camp of wanting him to be his main man up front. Although some of that may have to do with Lacazette getting over a recent injury. This is another one of those games where I I think people see the misses he has and they worry because he's missed some sitters or certainly some reasonably easy chances this season. I would point out that others have too, and you know Lacazette certainly had an easy chance in the game as well. But I wonder if there's maybe a little bit of the Edison Cavani effect happening. Cavani mm-hmm. got this reputation for being a bottler because he would miss some close chances, but he got such a monumental volume of chances that he was an extremely high goal scorer. You know, look at it this way. Let's say you get 50 shots from five yards out. Odds are you're going to miss 15 of them, 10 of them. Well, if you miss 10, 15 shots from five yards out, people think you're a bottler. It also turns out you just scored 40 goals, you know? So, I mean, I, I think there's some of that going on. I mean, to, for you, how how worried are you about the the misses Aubameyang has had this season? You, you think there's anything in that? Um, no, not really. I, I think you're right. Every, everything, um, well, you know, I don't watch Borussia Dortmund a lot, but everything I'd, I'd been told when he arrived was that he's not, especially clinical it's just his movement so good he gets lots of chances and that this is this is the kind of fashion for strikers at the moment really Aguero's the same if you watch City enough you see Aguero miss some absolute sitters but 
he's in the right position so often um, that invariably he scores lots of goals. And someone like Harry Kane's maybe a bit different. I'm not sure he misses sitters so much, but he shoots on sight from all angles, just shoots, shoots, shoots constantly. Um, and he shoots pretty well as well. Um, you know, he's not whacking balls out of the stadium. He's shooting on target. Um, and and that's that's generally what good modern strikers do and I imagine that's to do with the influence of data analytics um, in this in this kind of day and age that someone somewhere worked out that if you keep taking shots um, it's not hugely efficient but if you keep shooting under the bar and between the posts you'll score quite a lot of goals um, and I, I just think that's that's the player that Aubameyang is he's um, he's perhaps a fairly limited footballer not not you know he's he's not Theo Walcott um he but he's you know he's not an amazing footballer but what he is is a a really really good goal scorer and so long as he's putting away enough chances and you know in this game yeah he perhaps had one he should have scored but it's his movement at the back post and his touch that sets up the goal um i think that goal is as much down to him as it is to Torreira really um you could even say more so it's he's he's really kind of made something out of nothing there it's a great so, pass from Ganduzi too by the way yeah, 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 yeah. And he, you know, he'd slightly shifted over to the left, which is something we're seeing a lot in games at the moment. Genduzi kind of moving over to that left flank. Um, and so, no, I'm, I'm not hugely worried about it because that's the player he is. Um, and, and I think that's been reasonably obvious for a while. And I think it only becomes a problem if he hits a bit of a scoring drought, um, which he's not done or doing. So I'm, I'm not hugely worried about it. That said, I, you know, I do think. Um, you know, I, I don't think Emery has like um, a dog in this fight, as it were. We saw him play a Bamiyang at first up front and then it was Lacazette for a couple of months and it was always Lacazette. And now he's gone back. I think he's, you know, he's just having a look at things and probably in a couple of weeks it will be Lacazette again um, and we'll see. But um, no, I, I, while he's scoring and setting up goals uh, and, you know, his his net contribution Besides that, isn't like I said, he's not Walcott. He's not like shanking the ball out of play uh, three times a game and making you think, oh, for God's sake. Um, no, well, I'm not and he also leads the Premier League in goals, you know, so there's that. Well, indeed, yeah. That, and, and that's not insignificant. And I, I do wonder if there's a wider point here that we've begun to maybe underrate goals somehow, which sounds like a weird thing to say. But, no, I think you know, you're right. the kind of mm -hmm. the penalty box striker went a little bit out of fashion when the likes of, you know, Shevchenko, Ronaldo, Raul, Thierry Henry came along, and the likes of Cliver and Owen, they kind of began to shrink away, and we expected more from our strikers and I because I think this about Aguero all the time when people talk about you know the the conversation about say like some of the best overseas players that have ever come to the league he rarely figures which which, which is astonishing really given given his return and I do wonder if we've started to slightly underrate the commodity of goals yeah I, I mean it's in a game that often ends 1-0 to the winning team or you know 2-1 where you know one goal is between maybe 33% and 100% of the scoring output for the game, um, they are the single biggest contribution. And when you have someone who contributes them at a consistent rate and not just contributes goals, but your your best chances in the match keep falling to that one person, it's not a coincidence. You know, mm -hmm. at some point, if the same person keeps having the best chances, whether they miss them or they make them, they're doing something right to be in that position. Yeah, yeah. And he creates the goal. And there was a curler, brilliantly saved, right? That wasn't just De Gea who saved one. There was one in this match. Didn't he have a curler that was, yeah, that was brilliantly tipped around the post. So, you know, I mean, consecutive games where he, he maybe missed chances you'd like him to finish, but also where keepers, you know, made saves that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily expect them to make. I mean, I'm a little surprised, Clive, that it was he who stayed on and not Lacazette, given the way the minutes are accumulating, maybe related a bit to the... Um, to the injury situation that Lacazette is still recovering from. But let me ask you about the halftime changes. Do you think it's possible that, yes, they're tactical, but at some level, Emery's decision about how he's going to manage the squad through a very busy period is, I'm going to give guys half a match. And, yeah, exactly. And, and instead of playing you know, once a week or twice a week, they're going to play half a week or half twice a week, and that, that's his plan for managing, managing the fixture congestion. Absolutely, you just you're just letting people share games. 
That's exactly what he's doing. I do it myself for my own team. I, I work out my subs, and I and I say, right, you're going two centimeters. You're going to share a game, right? And uh, I have three. I have three strikers for two positions, and I say, right, you're going to share the game, and they all know. And they all know, and they go hard for a certain period, and they know that one of them's coming off, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. People are looking too deep into this. What we don't want is multiple hamstrings when we're coming to the end of December, when we, we can see that the pace at the top end of the table is, is really hot. And we need these players. So, I'm, you know, what keeps me away, Kelly? I'm looking at some of the form of a few of these players that we need to get back into top form, and they've dropped away. Right, you know, I'm looking at Iwobi. What I'm keeps thinking, me awake okay. is my wife in enclosed lingerie, just FYI. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'm looking at Iwobi, right? And he's got his dancing shoes on again. He's dancing around the ball. When he goes the other side, it goes dark for him, right? He loses his picture. So now people are starting to grumble because he doesn't look as confident. All that's happened is he stopped getting his head up at the right moment. Let's go back to basics technically and look at what you're doing and be really decisive and drive out of your spot once you're beating your man and make things happen. He's starting to think again. And when he starts to think, he starts to look like he's lacking in confidence. I'm looking at Mkhitaryan, one thing good, one thing bad. We need these two to get hot. We really do because we can't keep looking towards the two strikers and can't keep looking towards our base of our midfield to carry this team. Those half space players, they have to be better to get more out of our forwards to allow them to rest. They have to start scoring. They're not scoring goals. We need more from these players, right? We absolutely do. We found Colosino recently. The formation has changed to suit him, and Bellamy is just a monster, keeps producing, and he has done the regardless of where you play him. His numbers are great. But I'm looking at those two in those half spaces. I'm thinking, okay, we've got a problem with Ozil, he's injured. We've got a problem with Ramsey. He's walking out the door either in January or in the summer. And he's, I think it was unfortunate his latest injury. But we all know if you play three times a week, the old calves or hamstrings start to go. So we need one of Mkhitaryan or Iwobi to really step forward. Or somebody else. And I'm not sure who that's going to be. And so that's my worry when the short spaces of games come along. Hence why I'm very pleased to see the back three. Because I think it's a way of ensuring that we don't fall behind too much too by one or two goals too, too often it gives us a simplistic plan when we're playing multiple games with little time for preparation so what worries me earlier half space mate we're lacking a bit of sparkle in there mm-hmm. and um and we need to support those guys and and get them back to form otherwise we're gonna we're gonna plateau very very quickly let me stay with you just for a second clive i mean do you also think that you know, Unai Emery is still learning this squad. That's very clear. With the number of different things he tries, some of that is obviously tactical based on the opposition, and some of it is probably just still trying to find the best combinations and the best setup that get the most out of his squad. Do you think some of these halftime changes and some of the formations he's using, like the three-five-two today, uh, not today, but against Huddersfield, are mm. part of him learning his team so that he has the information he needs going forward? Because if you think about it, we went with the three-four-two-one for the very first time against Bournemouth right before Spurs and then used it again for Spurs. Do you think yeah. that when he picks something like this for home against Huddersfield, he says, look, it'll probably be good enough to get me through this game, but I'm looking at it because maybe I'm planning to use it against Liverpool at Anfield coming up. Uh, or actually, is it at Anfield or the Emirates? It's at I think so, Anfield. Anfield. Anfield, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, right. So, I mean, oh, right, because we just had the draw with them at Emirates. Um so, I mean, do you, th- do you think maybe that some of the selection for him is educational, is, is informational, so that he can put this down, he has a little marker in his head that says, okay, here's how that worked, because he might be thinking about using it in a game that's a little bit tougher, where he, he, he's trying to figure out the right setup for that. I think it could be partially that. I also think it's, it's utilizing the squad. I also think, you know, we, we, we have a podcast every twice a week of <laughs> talk analyzing games. And they get lots of information on other teams, and lots of other teams get information on us. It is not incumbent on us to keep doing the same things every single week. I mean, there was a discussion tonight on Liverpool and how they've changed, and they're playing Salah at times at centre-forward. They can't just bowl up to the Premier League with that front three exactly the same as it was last year, because everybody will be waiting for them. You know, everybody will be... Put them into crowd scenes and smashing them on the inside, not let them get shots off in wide areas. 
they will be ready for them. They'll be pressing their left technical players at the base of midfield. So they've changed some of those players. They've added Shakiri. They've changed formation at times, go to a 4 2 3 1. They play two centre forwards close. They are changing it up. And so are we. And we have to accept that. It's not a mistake. It's keeping yourself ahead of your coach, controlling what's actually happening. And other coaches are now reacting to us. To watch a a bright young Eddie Howe have to change his formation to match us, as is Pochettino, because we were getting on top, because we were driving them back. They were forced to react. I mean, crikey, no one's been changing their formations to play us. They've just been looking forward to it so they can give us a good kick in. This is a change, right? We have a coach that is maximising his squad by using systemic changes during games, pre-games, and we have to just absorb it and say, okay, I'm looking at the progression of the team. I'm thinking, okay, if this is the way he's going to be, we need people who can do more than one job. So we don't always have to go to the bench to make change. We need people that can do different things at different times so we can make changes on the pitch without having to change personnel. And I think we're going to see more of those sort of... um, all-rounder players that can carry, that can drive, that can press, that that modern, intense player with real carrying ability, dribbling ability and speed. I think we're going to see more of those players coming into to the squad, which is going to set our identity and set our tone of how and the pace we want to play. I've really noticed, I'm sure you have to, I'm not, not being individual here, when we play at speed, when we play at intensity, when we play one touch pass and really focus on those areas between the full back and centre half, we look really good. We really do. And if we can sustain that for longer periods with with a deeper pool set of players I think we've got a really bright future. I do. Yeah, I, I would say that. I think the one thing that worries me right now, Tim, and there's many things that worry me at any given moment, so <laughs> this is just one of them, is that, ironically, we seem to lack a playmaker, a consistent creator. Um, and we have mm-hmm. 350,000 pounds tucked away every two weeks for our every week. God. For Mesut Ozil. Um, right now, our best creative player in the entire squad is Sayed Kolasinac. <laughs> I mean, that is... That he has more key passes for us than any other player, I think, in the whole squad right now. So while I appreciate that, and I think the way we attack and the striker we have in Aubameyang sets up nicely for a, a wing back who gets into as many good crossing situations as Kolasinach does, it would be nice to have a player who can create chances from you know advanced midfield to the final third, so or the, you know the center of the pitch. Um, do you think we have seen against United and then particularly against Huddersfield that we do miss Ozil? And that, you know, incredible as it sounds, the best chance creator in the Premier League might be handy for us to work back into the squad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit, a bit. But also, um, I do think perhaps we fixate a little bit too much on the idea that a creator must be like an ethereal uh, Urzel-like presence. When um, when Harry Redknapp was managing Spurs um, and they were playing like Bale, Van der Vaart and Crouch, Crouch was miles ahead of everyone in terms of assists um, because, you know, they were they were going fairly direct, getting knockdowns, things like that. You look at um, Liverpool at the moment and, you know, they've signed Shaqiri, um, I guess, but who's their creator? They don't really? play with one. Yeah, they don't play with one. Yeah, the, 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 the turnovers are the, their, their creator. It, it, exactly, exactly, and uh, I, I mean, I, I suppose really the archetype, as as much as it hurts me to say, is Ericsson, because Ericsson can do both. He's got a pass. He's very good at set pieces, and he can break up play. Yeah. De Bruyne, um, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, De Bruyne, someone like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said a couple of weeks ago, I, you know, I n- never felt like. Uh, although I feel like the squad's moving away from Ozil a bit, that doesn't mean that he's completely useless. And yeah, he'd have been, like I said, in this game, I think in this system, in a 3-5-2, I think he'd have been very useful um, indeed because we'd have been able to give him a a fairly free role. Um, And actually, given that Huddersfield decided to press um, our three midfielders really, really intently, having a guy who wanders about all over the place could have been um, could have been quite quite handy. Or having a Ramsey who just drives them backwards could have been quite handy. The fact that we had three guys who were roughly in the same zone um, probably wasn't hugely helpful in this game. So y- yeah, absolutely, Özil would have been. I think Özil would have been really, really good um, for this game. 
Yeah. All right. Well, I'll stay with you for a second because it's 51 minutes into the podcast and I haven't mentioned Lucas Torreira, which pretty much is a sackable offense. This guy has been <laughs> nothing short of incredible. His winner is brilliant because it's not just the finish. Look, I think there are some people that are just like, oh, well, that's just the easiest way for him to finish that chance. Oh, really? Go out in your backyard and try it. I mean, mm. you can sky that. You can miss that. Yeah. That is a winner late in the game under pressure. You know, it's still an overhead kick. He he could have shanked it just enough that it bounces off the the keeper or it goes straight at the keeper he gets it down and into a place where it can't be saved it's a brilliant finish and watch the way he slides so there's a guy who covers the near post to to block him off and what does he do he slides back to the center of the box intelligently to get into a position where if the ball comes to him he's open and i thought Aubameyang, as we mentioned did a nice job getting it to him but i mean we thought that this guy would be a defensive savior and maybe he hasn't been a savior defensively but he's certainly given us some more uh stability and solidity in the way we can break up play in midfield. But what he's done with his progressive passing, with his play in the final third, when we've since we've gone to the back three, he has been deployed further up the pitch. And that's where we've seen things in his game I did not expect. How impressed have you been, not just with him overall, but with the, the parts of his game that maybe you weren't expecting to be as accomplished? Yeah, definitely. He's, um, he's not Flamini or Coquelin, is he? Yeah. Um... What a, what a put shame. It that way. <laughs> put it that way. Yeah, there, there's definitely more to his game. And, and obviously the destructive side of his game is um, they are his standout attributes and they are his, you know, the attributes that are most useful to Arsenal. But he's got more to him um, than that. And, uh, you know, I, I I wrote a piece actually for the Brazil Uruguay program um, a few weeks ago about yeah, same. why... Uh, <laughs> about why you know how on earth uruguay is the same size as wales in terms of population so how the hell do they always always get to the last stages of world cups and and you know threaten and win copper americas and go to finals and so they got no right to do it with and with a really impoverished club game almost like the welsh league um really and it, and it's because the national team because they're small enough the national team took responsibility for developing young players so Oscar Tabarez their manager kind of said right let's keep a really tight rein on everything from under 15s upwards let's get them all playing the same way and let's develop them all to be the same sort of player and the, and the 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 three things that he says he wanted to hardwire into all of the players in the junior teams was um, speed of movement Torreira's got that speed of thought Torreira's got that and technical ability. And this is, this is one of the things that's really under, underrated actually about Uruguay and Uruguayan footballers. They can play. They're, they're renowned for their um, uh, less, less, shall we say, aesthetic qualities. They can all play, every single one of them. Um, Godin, big, nasty bastard of a defender. He can play. Um, both feet, good passer. You know, they're, they're all, they've all got this underlying technical quality and and that's what we're seeing with Torreira and obviously he, he he started his career playing a little bit further forward so he kind of you know when he was in the Uruguay under 17 team he was a bit more of an attacking play he came into the under 20 team when he was at Sampdoria and he started playing as a more defensive player so what you've got is a really good all-round education with um one it's one of the best educations you can get if you get in one of those Uruguay junior teams um, quite frankly, and 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 that's what we're seeing. And the other thing about Uruguayan players is that they tend to settle. Um, you know, not not all South American players do, but um, look at all those big Uruguayan players. Uh, Cavani has been in Italy and France. You know, Suarez has been in England, Holland, and Spain. Um, you know, Forlan has been all over the world. Uh, played in Japan, uh, England, Spain, Brazil absolutely everywhere uh loads of them have done it none of them have had any kind of issues with settling in either culturally or to the leagues that they play in and what that shows you is that they're all really rounded footballers and that's what we're seeing from lucas Torreira. um he's he's a really rounded footballer he's got a job um he's got his main job and he's he's very good at it but he's got a bit more to his game. And I think at the moment, we're probably in that honeymoon period where that's surprising people, um, not least our opponents, and, and they're not quite picking it up. But, you know, that, that'll that be his next challenge. He'll be 
people will be um you know our, our opponents in the next few weeks southampton burnley they'll be watching videos and they'll be um they'll, they'll be getting wise and you know he was fouled seven times against huddersfield so it's already happening so that that's his next challenge yeah and i mean look it, we we rely on this player this this is the player that seems like the the one that we have to keep healthy as as um clive was saying and i i think as silly as it sounds and cynical as it is, I think he needs to pick up a yellow against Southampton and miss mm -hmm. the the League Cup fixture against Tottenham. I mean, I, it still works mm -hmm. that way, right? I think he would still miss that and then be eligible for yeah. Burnley the weekend later. So, you, you know, that's what has to happen because God forbid he picks it up, you know, against um, you know against Burnley and misses the Liverpool match at Anfield. We just can't have that happen. I I think I can't help but see the parallels when you talk about the way Uruguay develops their players. Uh, Tim, for the parallels with U.S. Soccer Federation and just how uh, effective and uh, organized. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a complete raft of horseshit. Um, in any event, uh, Clive, I mean, for you, where are you seeing the biggest influence on the squad from Lucas Torreira? Yeah, we can add another Uruguayan player. There's a young guy at Juventus called Bentacore. Yeah. Well, I tell you, if any way we could steer him out of there, it's probably not going to happen. That's the way. We, I always say when you have a, a, a pending superstar, invest in him properly by bringing one of his mates in. If there was a way we could get a young player from Uruguay in to make sure Torreira doesn't go anywhere, I'll be doing that right now and I'll be changing his contract immediately because the sky is the limit for this guy. It is the limit. He could literally, right in this season, he can play for anybody in the world in what he does because he's so fast to the ball. He's so quick and decisive. He reads the game. He, he he works off your touch, so he steals the ball from you. He works out which side you like to favour off your touch, and he and he dummies one side, goes the other, and just steals it. I mean, he's got all the tricks about them dispossession, and once he gets it, he just think about you know slicing you in two and hurting you. And um, and he doesn't he doesn't have to be in front of the back four. He just he's just a midfield player. He's good. Uh, I think he's quite nice that they've um moved him forward slightly and in this game and, and they've given him the chance to really sort of engage higher up. I think it moves the emphasis of our play higher up. I don't think it's going to suit every game. Um, when we go back to the four two three one, I think then then we will see we'll, we'll see him a little bit deeper. But yeah, it, when, when I see players like this, I, I get worried immediately because then I think, well, what if they're not there? You know, I spent we spent eight years, well I did anyway, worrying about when Patrick Vieira was suspended. Because when he was there, we, we didn't need anybody else to play with him. But when he wasn't there, we suffered for it. You know, we and I, I and that, this is the most influential midfielder since since him in my time. To be fair, um, I think because um, was slightly different, he had a real hot period. But this guy is um, he, he's something special, and he's so young and um, and he's a modern midfielder. Vieira was he reinvented centre midfield with his with his size and his, his, his leg length and what he was doing, driving out of areas and really tackling and dominating people physically. And he forced people to change how they looked at centre midfield. And Torreira was doing a similar thing. We've seen this before, but not at Arsenal, not someone so diminutive, really, really on defensive side, really, really influenced in this way. And um, maybe partly because we were starving for this type of player, that we really appreciate it. But he almost epitomizes where the manager wants to take us. And I think he is like the new flagship player. And of course, when we see that, we start to question some of the other ones, and we the ones that are the previous flagship players. And, and that's where we are with Ozil, and that's where we are with Ramsey, for example, who for me epitomise along with Walcott the last few years of, of, of Benga's reign. So we're seeing a turning of the page, right? And um, yeah, it's going to be good to watch. Yeah, really good to watch. And, uh, you know, it's so easy when you get the right player in a position at the right age, the right point in his development, to beat the club with the stick of not having found him sooner. But I think there are two things from this. One, it's not easy. It's not easy to find these players because everyone is looking for them, and some of the biggest clubs are looking for them with the biggest wages on offer. But what I think is really exciting about it is it's a reminder that you don't have to go sign 70 million pound superstars from Barcelona to totally transform your club. The players are out there. 
The talented yeah. players are out there in our price range ready to come to Arsenal at the right age. And, you know, I think Liverpool have done a nice job with that over the past few seasons and really rebuilt their squad through making those moves, whether it was Suarez or Coutinho or Sterling. We can do it. We can do it, and we can be a force, you know, through a combination of maybe getting stars like we got with Ozil and Alexis and Aubameyang and Lacazette to some extent, but also getting guys like Torreira and Ganduzi. I mean, you look at the future of that midfield. If they stay for five seasons, what could that really become? Something special to build around for sure. I'll never uh, forget it, just quickly mm-hmm. before you go on. With, with Torreira, I think we actually paid more than his um, buyout just to make sure we secured him. Was and it again, one pound more than his buyout no, by any chance? Because no, I've heard about, that's a really smart strategy. Uh, I think it was like three to four million over. We didn't have to pay that much. And, and Can there was I a little stop bit you of for a second? Then what the fuck am I going to say to everybody on Twitter who's like, oh, what did you expect us to pay over Suarez's buyout? Should, should, we, should we overpay by three million if we don't have to? What, what, what did we just do? Yeah. I'm sorry, sorry I, can't, I, can't, that's what I, I can't help myself. But I'm that's sorry. what I was leading on to. There was an opportunity. There was a, If there was a potential to lose him, they said, no, let's pay the money. Let's make sure we secure him. Let's make sure he comes straight after the World Cup. There's no delay. And that's, that's how he should behave, right? That's how you should behave. You identify somebody, pay the money to get him. Now, it was 26 million. <laughs> how much is he worth right now? Just 50? Just have a get. Easy. 50. Easy. Easy peasy. 50. 50 and, and by million. the way, I hate to bring this up because I hope he stays for 10 seasons. But the fact that we now have a 50, 60 million pound asset sitting in our squad means we can maybe survive if we lose a few guys like Ramsey on a free and, you know, Alexis for for nothing for Mkhitaryan. I mean, you don't want to think that way. That's a selling club mentality, but you have to have those assets. So you're absolutely right, Clive. Um, I want to ask the most important question of the whole podcast as the final question, but Tim, do you have a final thought on what we've been saying about Terrera? No. Good. Um, and by the way, I will just say, that isn't just a goal he scores. That's a crucial goal because with Chelsea beating City, which is great because they don't go, you know, uh, invincible, but also tough because it's not a great result in the context of us trying to get ahead of them. You know, and with Spurs continuing to win, I mean, we could not drop points there. It's not a time we can afford to drop points. And so there's a lot of compression at the top, but it's crazy. We are on an 80-point pace, and we're in fifth. It is going to be one hell of a death match to get top four this season. Tim, I'll finish with the final most important question. What style of raffle or competition do you think is the most appropriate for choosing who gets to play center back for Arsenal at Southampton. Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah. I missed the first uh, part. Uh, of that. Okay, so what type of raffle or competition All right. <laughs> is is the best for selecting who plays center back at Southampton? <laughs> like pick a number um, or a ticket or you know balls in 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 the little container thing or get some numbers between like 35 and 90 and um whoever squad numbers come out let's do that yeah i was gonna say ironically they're gonna be wearing that i mean all kidding aside (laughs) just i know it i know it's not our next match our next match is carry bag and no one's gonna have to play in that anyway but what the fuck do we do in defense for southampton away we've lost four nil there this isn't i realize they've got you know they've got a new coach they're gonna have that bump you know unfortunately we don't get to face mark hughes what are we going to do defensively for that? Yeah, I I kind of wonder if we'll go to a back three because I think Monreal will probably be all right. Um, and then, you know, we can have Bellerin and Kolasinac playing as wing backs again. And then, you know, and then have Licksteiner on the right. And, you know, and and then the the thing is with Koscielny, I I just don't know because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm no sports scientist and I really don't know how I'd handle it because Emery did say last week that he was looking at giving Koscielny the, the Carabag game. But now it's a kind of it's a really delicate mix, because if you play him in that game for more than, say, a half, I mean, it would be a really, really big risk surely to play him again against Southampton but you also can't just drop him straight back into the Southampton game so you know I I, I don't really know do do we give him the last 20 to 30 minutes against Carabag is that enough I you know is that even too much and do you Um, even learn any I mean we've seen that team they don't attack he may not have to defend at all if he plays so like no is it anything more than just a run out I don't know that that gets you ready for a trip to St. Mary's you know no no, no, but I, I think it's more. Um, it, it, no, it probably doesn't. If he played ninety minutes against Carabag, I'm sure that's not. That's still not quite. Still preparation. Not. He'd be better playing a half for the under twenty threes. You know. 
Yeah, yeah, but it's it's more, you know, that you know, he he snaps his Achilles tendon. That's you know, that that cannot happen again. Like this has to be like kid gloves. Um but yeah, I I just don't know. Um that that's really one for the fitness staff. I really don't know how we handle that. Um to be quite honest with you. I I just almost feel like you have to play him and you say, look, he doesn't have much of a career left. I know it's callous and sad to say that, but that is the reality. He's getting up there in age and he's just come back from an injury that can end a career. If this isn't a situation where we can throw him in, what is, you know, and I realize he's just back, but he's back. I would play him for 30 minutes against carry back just to keep him fit. And assuming he holds up and he passes all the fitness checks, I'd start him at the central central defense, you know, as the middle center def- central defender in a back three. Easy for me to say, mm. with Nacho and Lichtsteiner on either side, and Bellerin yeah, and, would, and and closing it, at you. And and it would have to be a back three, I think, just, just to kind of protect him as well a little bit, you know, um, in terms of n- not having too many people running around him and in behind him, almost just have him take care Could of that you, area, you know. Yeah, having like very defined roles for those. For those back three so that basically we're not commit- committing him to sprinting backwards all the time could you do an, an el nenny maybe i mean you know an, an, a shaka it's even probably full back it, it's it's pro- I, I i'm not sure i'd do that i think um i think so long as he's not one of the wide center halves um i, I don't think we have to worry too much there um, I, I think it should be you know the center pin um as it were but i think we've got to be careful about putting too many guys who aren't natural back there especially size wise right i mean we need someone who has the physicality of a striker of a center forward against a central defender against a center forward like shane long i think uh who i believe is still their striker is he not um mm. we need you know we need kashelny or, or maybe even medley i mean i realize that's throwing him in at the absolute deep end but i think you need someone with a center back's body and a center back's mindset uh to to win the duels and and maybe battle physically a little bit um, you know, Lichsteiner and Monreal can can maybe do those wide central defender roles, but they need someone with the physicality and, and physical size and stature of a central defender uh, uh, in the middle there. I think, Clive, for you, how would you approach it? Yeah, I would do the same thing. It has to be a back three. I think we're going to see the back three for most of the month um, and then maybe reassess in, in January. Um, don't underestimate Kishon. I did catch some of those. Well, he played one and a half under 23 games. And um, I know they're, they're non-contact football more and most, but um, he, he, looked, he looked pretty good and he was really physical. So there's no issue there. They wouldn't be putting him out there. I think I wouldn't play him against Carabag. And the reason why is because where he's going to struggle is recovery. right? So you, when you haven't played for while and exerted yourself, you can always do it that one game. But then what you can't do is that you feel every single ache and pain until you become battle-hardened. And so I would say I would just keep working him in a controlled environment, make sure his fitness levels go up. But when he goes into an uncontrolled environment, he has a chance to compl- to get you know, three-quarters of that game. And then you know your suggestion about El Nenny? If we're doing well and winning well, then El Nenny can share that game with him for the last 15 minutes and then hopefully hold that situation so we don't get into that red zone where if he's going to pick up a cramp or an injury or a calf pull, it's going to be the last 15 minutes. Because I do believe we're going to need him throughout the season. We definitely need him to not just play one game, but play many games. And and I don't write him off at all, actually. I That injury, just a reattachment. It's not the end of the world like it used to be years ago. It's a reattachment, and I think he, he'll be fine. Um, but what he will struggle with is in those soft muscle injuries just due to inactivity. So we have to manage that load. And because of the suspensions, we're going to struggle to manage that load. So I would take him out of car back completely, try to get 80 minutes out of him, hopefully in a game that we're winning well so we can get El Nenny on to just play that role for the last 15 minutes and go from there. Can you imagine how uncomfortable the last few seconds of this podcast would be if Paul was here after you said we'll struggle to manage that load? I think we, sh- <laughs> we should all be thankful that that, that did not happen. Um, but in any event, Clive's on Twitter at Clive PAFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. Tim's on Twitter at Stilberto. Thank you, Tim. My pleasure as always. Our Patreon is going to be straight fire before the end of this month because episodes on Torreira, Aubameyang, Unai Emery, halftime shows, 
live match commentary. It's all coming back. My busy work season is wrapping up. Not that anyone cares about that, but it does mean that hashtag content can come your way, and we are excited for it. And then we will have special Patreon features during the January transfer window that are top secret. So top secret, in fact, that uh, none of us know what they are, but they are coming, and we're looking forward to that. We love you. We really appreciate you for listening, as always. Um, some good response to the latest pods, and, and we do appreciate uh, you for, for supporting us that way. And if you are signing up on Patreon, uh, it really does mean the world to us. We hope you're having a wonderful holiday season. Um, going to be busy trying to get the podcast in uh, over that period, but we will definitely get it done. So give us a five-star review, write nasty things about Paul and Scott in the comments, and we'll be back to talk to you more after Arsenal 10, carry a bag nil. <laughs>